this morning's session, we're going to have a workshop and we are going to welcome um, Mr. Esperanza. I'm so sorry if I can't pronounce your name correctly. And um, from Louisiana, the United States, and he's from River Parishes Community College. And yeah, he has a co-presenters, Jared Osier and uh, Miss Donna Ribicki. Okay, so our guest speakers will present um, the topic, and the topic is utilizing open simulators STEM. Okay, so um, participants, so please join me in welcoming three speakers for presenting their topics. Okay, welcome. Well, uh, once again, I want to uh, thank you for inviting us. Um, there are three of us who are going to present today. I'm Esperanza Zenon, and I am a physics and physical science professor at River Parishes Community College. Uh, I have one of my co-presenters, Mr. Jared Use. He's a professor of mathematics and uh, Ms. Donna Rabicki. She's an instructor of chemistry. Uh, and we are here from River Parishes Community College in Louisiana. Uh, it's a great honor to be here with you this morning, your time, six o'clock p.m. our time. Um, and so today we're gonna be sharing some information and hopefully engaging in a discussion with you on how we utilize uh, open simulators to support our STEM classes. So we'll kind of bounce around during the presentation, each of us sharing uh, information relevant to our um, the content area. So I'm physical science, Mr. Use is mathematics, and Ms. Rabicki in chemistry. And then what we hope is that, um, you know, while we're sharing, you'll engage with us in the discussion, uh, letting us know if you're using simulators and if so, what kinds of simulators and then what type of activities you do with those simulators. So I'll go ahead and uh, get to our um, agenda slide. So this basically gives you the rundown of where we want to go. I'll cover a bit of background regarding uh, this whole OER process. Uh, then we'll join together and uh, share some simulators and activities with you. And we'll look at some other uh, OER sources. And we'll try to do that, um, you know, uh, as quickly as possible so that we can leave room for a, a discussion because we want to share with you, but more than that, we want to get your feedback and we want to know what you're doing. And then we'll leave time uh, for any lingering uh, questions that you might have. So just to give you a bit of background um, to kind of set the stage for why we're doing what we're doing, um, at our college, there's a, a, a you know, a movement to, to get away from high price textbooks. And you can see um, that, you know, the price of textbooks is through the roof. Um, so a, a better than a thousand percent since 1977. Uh, and that's a stat as of 2015, um, you know, which is you know, probably e even um, more of an increase now. So um, we, you know, students really uh, pay a lot for books. And so we're trying at our college to get away from that, to save the students some money. Um, and, and so, you know, we found that uh, students go through a lot of different methods to try to cope with the cost of textbooks. Um, in some instances, students might try to purchase an older edition of a textbook they might delay purchasing the textbook. And a lot of times that delay uh, has to do with, uh, you know, financial aid that they might be receiving to, uh, to a, attend school. Uh, some never purchase the textbook because they just can't afford it. And then sometimes uh, there's textbook sharing where students are sharing the textbooks, you know, with each other. And then 
Some students resort, resort to some other tactics. Uh, I can tell you uh, from personal experience, um, <laughs> I've utilized these other tactics and sometimes they aren't the uh, uh, quote, most legal way to do things, but you know, hey, as they say, uh, by hook or crook. And, and sometimes that's literally what, is, what it's been for, for uh, some students. Uh, but the, the idea here is that any of these methods for coping with the cost means that day one, the student might not have the textbook that they need, which means that the, the opportunity for learning and utilizing that material is reduced, right? Uh, which can have academic implications. And so, you know, we want to help students so that they don't have to worry about these things, right? We want them to have what they need day one so that they can be fully engaged in the learning process. You know, for many students, this, you know, this cost, um, you know, produces a gap where equity is a concern, you know, uh, equity says what? You meet a student where they have need, right? Every student gets what they need. Not every student gets treated the same, but every student gets what they need. And uh, at our college, there's a, a, a good percentage of students who receive financial aid. And what happens in many instances there is if that financial aid is not available day one, the students aren't able to get the books that they need right away. Sometimes there's a delay there. Um, and so, um, you know, that has equity Im implications. That means students aren't on equal footing or they don't have what they need to, to engage in the course. Um, what we have found now by reducing the cost and uh, we can increase the number of courses that students take. So if they don't have to spend $250 on a physical science book, they can use that money to take an extra course. Uh, that means they can move through the courses you know, in a much faster pace, right? Their, their time on campus gets reduced, right? They're able to matriculate uh, much faster. Um, they can use those funds for, for other needs. Many students at, on our co at our college are working with families uh, and and so, you know, money is important. Uh, we don't want our students having to make choices about whether they, you know, provide for what uh, they need in their home, personal life, um, you know, versus what they need in their education life, right? Uh, so, you know, when we when we reduce the cost, they can do use those funds for other purposes. Ultimately, the goal is to get them to graduate as quickly as possible. So when you reduce the cost, students can graduate sooner. That means they can go to work sooner, right? Because the whole goal in, at a community college, in many cases, we have students who are transferring uh, to four-year schools, but we have a good number of students who are trying to get a credential to go to work. And by reducing the cost of a degree, they can go to work sooner. And that means that, that creates real opportunity for them, right? that creates life-changing opportunities for those students and their families, uh, because many of them are first-generation students. And so they're the first in their family to go to college. So, you know, the sooner they can go to work and provide, the more they can do for themselves, their families, and their communities. And that's important. Um, so as faculty, you know, as, as uh, teachers, we don't get to decide a whole lot of things. Uh, we don't we don't set fees. We don't get to determine room and board, uh, you know, personal expenses, transportation. The one thing we do have some control over in our courses is what books or supplies we're going to use, right? And so by choosing to use an open resource, right, a freely available resource, uh, we can make an impact in the books and supplies area. So uh, we'll jump into some of the simulators that we use. Um, so you see a good number listed here of different simulators that we use in our STEM courses. Uh, FET, which is, we'll, we'll take a look at these here in a moment. Uh, FET is a, res uh, a simulator 
um, uh, repository that can be used for physics, it can be used for chemistry, um, and there are even some that might be adaptable to, to mathematics. Um, Walter Fent, those are, they, they are physics and even chemistry, if, you, if you're depending on what you're using it for, uh, and mathematics uh, simulators. And then we'll just go into looking at these various ones. And, and uh, you know, what we want to do is share some resources that we use that are freely available and then get you to talk to us about what you're using. OK. And by the way, if you have access to this presentation, I do believe in the conference uh, platform, all of the link, all of the items that you see here are linkable and clickable. You can go actually and, and take a you can take a copy of our presentation and you'll have access to these items uh, in that presentation. OK, so um, this is a screenshot of FET, the FET simulations. Uh, you can see, look, they have physics simulations and all the various categories that they have, you know, topic areas that you typically cover in an undergraduate um, physics class. There's chemistry, and you can see there's math, and there's even some earth science and biology um, simulators available. And you can sort them, you see, by grade level uh, compatibility, meaning is it HTML5? Um, is it uh, still Java based? So, you know, um, there's a great many uh, simulations and you can use them on a variety of platforms. Okay. The HTML5 simulators are really, really nice because students don't need any special software to engage with those simulators. They open and run in the browser, which is really convenient. Um, Walter Fint. These are um, a set of simulators developed by Walter Fint. He's actually in Germany. And um, these are, you can use these, um, you know, with no, no uh, problems. Uh, they're freely available on the web. Um, so uh, I have listed here just some samples you can see of some physics apps that you can access on that website. Um, and they are HTML5 as well. Uh, so that's really nice because they run in the browser. Uh, so um, now I'll kind of turn this over to my co-presenter, Jared. Uh, Jared, the floor is yours, just uh, so you can talk a little bit about the math. If you want to share one, feel free. Um, I'll, I'll hey, thank you, Esperanza. Um, yeah, these, um, these particular apps for mathematics, um, I have, uh, played around with the, um, the online calculator. So the one that is like listed under the algebra one, um, a lot of our students that we have as, uh, Dr. Xenon pointed out on the, uh, at our community college, um, sometimes they struggle with um paying for things uh and you know whether it be a financial aid reason or you know they have to make the decision between school versus you know eating or feeding their families and so uh we like to you know turn them to their attention to online versions of uh of calculators that are out there and um, when Dr. Xenon showed me this one, uh, it, it's, um, there's a lot of different online calculators, uh, that are out there, but this is a pretty nice one, uh, that can be used. Esperanza, can you click on that? Will it open? I was just about to ask if you'd like me to click on it. I'll, yeah, go ahead. Um, I'll, I'll do that. I'll see if, if it'll come up for us. Uh, okay. I might have to stop the share and then start it again because sometimes when you open something in the web, you can't readily see it. Uh, yeah. You'll have to tell me if you see the screen because I can't tell what you're seeing. Right. Yeah, I don't see it yet. Okay, so what I'm going to do is uh, and then I'm going to share again. Just bear with me because that's how it does things there. Uh, so uh, let's see if that's it right there. Is that, 
Did it open? Can you see it? No, it still has you just, the, you the just website. See the, okay. Oh, but I'm actually on the website now. Okay. So now let me click it and see. Do you see that? Oh, yeah. There it is. Okay. Yeah, it's tricky when you want to go from the presentation to a website after stop share and then share again when that website is available. Yeah. So I don't mind doing that. Please, uh, I skipped over my the, the physics, but you know when we get to the discussion, if if uh, if anybody in the audience wants to wants me to, I'll share that simulator. We can take a look at it, right? Yeah, and so um, it's not the. I mean, it, it's not your handheld calculator. It's not even smartphone. It's not not even close to what a smartphone could could do. But um, as far as something being open and free, um, one of the things that you know we can share with our students is something like this. And uh, it's it's probably not the the easiest thing to be able to use. Uh, I uh, use it on the uh, on the go. As far as that goes, I would probably turn to my cell phone but uh just one of the many tools that are out there that we can have available for our students in the open source realm um if you'll go so back Jared, go ahead Jared, yeah. uh, how how about if i could uh, if you tell me something that you you know I, um a calculation that you would do with this tell me tell me what the click and i'll do it so i can show the audience a little bit of how it works maybe yeah um Fractions is one of the things that a lot of our students do struggle with. Um, so you can, uh, if you choose that fraction option and you, uh, you'll you type in, yeah, the numerator and then you can choose the denominator and I, yeah, maybe don't put a two, do like a seven or something in there. So we can have a non reduced fraction, I guess, yeah. And then you can add or subtract. Uh, so maybe we can add another fraction. So do the fraction option again, Esperanza, and do um, the numerator. And maybe do three and then do the denominator. And then don't do a seven. Yeah, do three eighths. And it gives you the result of the fraction in fraction form. Um, and one of the things that I know a lot of my students struggle with with a basic situation is, you know, a lot of our calculators, even the high powered graphing calculator will give you the answer as a decimal. And we like to have the answer as a fraction that comes out uh, as a uh, actual non-mixed number, so that improper fraction that's showing on the screen there. Um, and this is probably one of the uh, tools that I've discovered that actually shows it to you in that fraction online without having even your calculator on the computer that comes with the computer will give it to you as a decimal. Um, so here's one of those calculators that gives it to you as a um, as a fraction, which is uh, which is kind of cool. So, mm -hmm. okay. So uh, would it um, w would you like to show anything else, or do could I I'll just stop sharing and go back to the previous? Yeah, you can stop sharing and go back, Esperanza. Okay. All right. Just want to make sure I'm in the right yeah. place there. Okay. There we go. All right. So that again, that's, uh, you know, the math, mat, uh, an example of an open mathematics simulator that you can utilize and you can see there are other types of activities. So let me see if I can, if it goes to the next screen, bear with me. Uh, I might have to stop share and close that website before it will let me go back to There we go. Okay, so now let me. Um, okay, there we go. Okay, I thought I lost you guys for a moment there. So. Okay, and I'll go get back into. Bear with me because I gotta scroll back to where I was. 
So, and we have taken a look at that and that. And so um, here's a, a simulator. You can see that there are a variety of options there. Donna, I believe you shared this with me. So if you uh, wouldn't mind jumping in and I can navigate anywhere that you need me to, to share some uh, sharing information on chemistry as it pertains to what you might do in your classes. Okay, thank you, Esperanza. This is one of the websites that I use um, for my online chemistry class. I really like uh, Amrita. They have a lot of websites. And actually what Esperanza is showing you right here in the middle, um, when you do click on chemical sciences, so when you click on that, it's going to give you other options. It'll give you an option to look for physical chemistry labs. It'll give you an option to look for organic chemistry labs. It'll give you the option to look for inorganic or advanced analytical chemistry. And these are all online labs. Um, right now, I'm in the middle of uh, building a lab um, online for our chemistry two class. And I use a lot of, I have about half my labs in this class come from Amrita. And the reason I use this is because when you do click and use one of their labs, they give you uh, the directions on how to do the lab. They give you the background. They give you the theory behind it. They give the procedures and they show you how to work the simulation. So I kind of, I kind of look at Amrita like a one-stop shop. So they give the student everything they need in that one lab to complete that lab. So this is definitely one of my uh, favorite websites to go to when I'm looking for an online virtual lab. And like I said, the fact that they can break it down into physical chemistry, organic, um, analytical. So you can choose any of those options to look for labs. Um, so you, we should, you know, you should definitely check this website out if you get the chance to. And it's an OER. Everything's free. Um, and so they have a lot of good resources for your students. So uh, I think. I, I do believe you, Jared and Donna, you also have the uh, of it, um, capability of sharing your own screen. I, I think so, since we're all presenters. Oh. So here's here's okay. what we can do, um, you know, since we're kind of- Because I have, I have some, that'd be great. Yeah. I have some of them. Yeah, up. I'm going to, I'm going to stop, I'm going to stop share. And Donna, you can take over and bring up the website. And then okay. when we're ready to pick up the presentation, I'll resume navigating. Is that That'd be that's great. reasonable? We'll just kind That'd of work it that way uh, for going forward. So we'll make it a lot easier than me stopping share and sharing again. Just okay. when you need That'd to share something, tell me and I'll. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And Donna, okay. you can take over and maybe you can navigate to that um, Amrita website and just, um, you know. Yeah, yeah, okay, let's see. There you go. Can you see my, you can see my screen? Yes. You can? Okay. So this is the uh, Amrita, uh, when you click on, like I clicked into physical chemistry lab here. And so actually one of the labs that uh, my chemistry two to get familiar with um, using these, I'm using this, this one right here called cryoscopy. And basically it's on colligative properties and it's on the freezing point depression uh, of, you know, colligative properties. And so here's where I was saying where they have the theory. And so the students can read about um, the theory, what math is involved, what they need to do. And then right here is where they have the procedure. So they'll tell you what's required in this lab. So you can see they have the procedures written. They have the observations that they should re record, um, the things that they should calculate down here at the bottom. And so I also really like this because they have a little self-evaluation. If you want to, to take, uh, I'm actually signing into my account. I think it'll sign me in. Ah, give me one minute, Esperanza. So. Thank you, Tom. So they, they do have to sign up. It's a free account. Um, but I love this little self-evaluation. They can test themselves. Um, sometimes I use some of these, I have a pre-lab before my lab, so I might ask them some of these questions right here, but they can see, and they could submit this and see if they are, you know, ready to do the simulation. Um, and then they can basically just move along these tabs at the top. And so they can click on the simulator right here. Um, of course, I will tell you, that's one thing I 
have noticed about Amrita is that you have to have flash. And of course, flash is going away on Chrome at the end of the year in a few days. So uh, it's going to do to solve that. Um, I, I use Internet Explorer to open up this website usually. And so that is one problem I found with this lab is that they use flash. But uh, after you move through that, like you can go to the assignment and these are some problems they can work out that they should be able to do after the lab. Um, just more problems they can solve. And so, as I said, this is Amrita and this is why I like them because I feel like they are a one-stop shop. They give everything they need to the students to get ready for this lab and to how to perform it. So uh, that's one of, the, one of the ones I use. Okay, so um, Donna, if you'll just stop your share and then I'll okay, okay, go. okay. So now I'm able to um, I'll share. Okay, and so um, I think we'll be able to. You know, it's, it's not letting. Uh, let me do it this way. I'm gonna have to go back in to the actual presentation and share it because it kills the share when I, um, okay, and then, okay, so Donna, I do, I believe as well, this is one of yours, but uh, just before you jump in, one of the ones that you shared with, uh, shared with me, mm -hmm. um, but uh, also notice that uh, this OLABS has uh, not just chemistry, but physics, biology, math, English, so uh, now, again, remember, these are all, this is all open content, right? Meaning it's freely available for you to um, utilize in your courses, right? So Donna, if you wanted to just mention something about OLABS, um, you know, I'll be, uh, uh, and whenever you're ready, we'll move forward. Yeah, sure. W one of the things, now I will tell you that, um, O Labs is also you can see at the top of excuse me of Esperanza's screen that they are <coughs> excuse me they're intertwined with Amrita and so um, they seem to work together um, and so I like this one because they're also by grade level so when you click on chemistry in the middle it will actually show you like class 12 class 11 class 10 and so it kind of goes through and so they're depending on what level you're teaching they have some maybe um more advanced labs if you're teaching more advanced students or they have some beginning labs if you're teaching some students who are not as experienced in chemistry yet so depending on your needs i, I like o labs they have the different uh levels of sometimes it's the same lab but they'll have them maybe in a ninth grade level and then again at a 12th grade level and it becomes a little more complex. So that's one of the reasons I like OLAB as well. Thank you, Donna. Sure. And I, I do want to point out that because OLABs is, uh, very, is very related to Amrita, they do the same thing as well. They have the theory they have the procedure and then they have uh, sometimes they have an animation showing you how to use the simulator, which is really nice, too. Um, and so, again, OLABS is also like a one stop shop where your students can get everything they need right there in that website. OK, let's see. It's not advancing here for me. OK, so bear with me for a second, because it is not allowing me to go forward here so mm -hmm. i might have to do it that's okay i think way. i think it's one of mine again is my next one right so um there we go uh, let's see if it there we go now it, it froze for a moment it didn't want to advance so um, yeah so this is another yeah. one that donna shared with me you can as you can see there's a great number of chemistry resources available, um, you know, in the OER market uh, that you can utilize. Yeah, Chem Collective. Um, again, it's uh, it's 
it's not related to Amrita, but it is like Amrita where they have a lot of, it's a one-stop shop. Um, so Chem Collective, the, the labs they offer, we would teach in our Chemistry 2 class. Like we teach thermochemistry and kinetics and equilibrium in our Chemistry 2 class. So depending on how your chemistries are broken up, um, they don't really have a whole lot on things like naming compounds or how to separate mixtures. It's really for the more advanced chemistry. So you, you won't find basic level chemistry there, but if you need something for advanced chemistry, then Chem Collective has it. And if you look on the left-hand side, you can see all of um, the topics. You know, they have stoichiometry, uh, thermochemistry, kinetics, equilibrium. So when you click on one of those links on the side, uh, not only does Chem Collective have different labs, um, they have tutorials, they have lectures, they have quizzes your students can use. So they have a lot of resources just besides the labs. And so one of the unique things... So Donna, how about this? I'll stop sharing and I'll let you bring up Kim Collective and you can show uh, show what, uh, you know, just give them uh, some of the, uh, show them okay, some yeah, of the resources. Actually, and then uh, during the discussion, if anybody wants to drill down deeper, we can do that during the discussion. But I'll stop sharing and let you bring up Kim Collective and you can show them. And then when you're ready, I'll resume, okay? Okay, that sounds good. I'm actually, uh, I actually have uh, Kim Collective collective open because I'm working on a lab for my students. So can you see that? Yeah. Okay, awesome. So this is one of the Kim Collective labs that I'm actually working on for my students. Um, so Kim Collective has two types of labs. They have labs where they give the instructions and the students can follow along step by step. But then they also have what are called auto graded virtual labs. And in their auto-graded labs, the students have to design the lab. And they're called auto-graded because if you scroll down after the students, they literally have a workbench that they can manipulate. Um, so after the students manip manipulate their workbench, after they do their math and they figure out the solution, they can come put it in right here and they can press the check button. And so what I make my students do is put their answers in and hit the check button and it's got to show me correct. And so if they did everything correct, it'll show them that they got this correct. And these are called the auto graded labs by uh, Kim Collective. If you click right here, they'll give you a little explanation. They'll tell you, hey, you need to make this buffer um, with a certain pH, you know, make sure you make 100 milliliters of it. But you can they can they have a virtual uh workbench and for every lab this the solutions change right so because this one is a buffer we have a lot of acids and bases and so you know let's say you can drag this over onto your workbench here and they'll tell you information about okay well here's information about the distilled water right and you can go back to the stock room and let's just say that i want to fill up uh, an erlenmeyer flask so you can come and uh, pour your water onto your, you just drag it on top of your Erlenmeyer flask and then you can say, you know, I want to pour in 50 milliliters of water. You can do this for the acids. You know, some of the labs have actually that they have to put, um, they maybe they have to measure it on the scale. So there's a scale and a Bunsen burner and a lab. Uh, one of the labs I was looking at today had um, they had to do a titration so there was a burette up there and there was some solid um, you know a solid acid that they had to do the titration on so it's really meant to actually simulate what they would do in the lab and so after you do that like you can put you know let's just say I'll uh, put some HCl in here let's say I'll put 10 milliliters and so once you do that, it'll tell you, okay, well, you now you, I have 60 milliliters and you can right click and you can click on thermal properties. If you want to change the temperature, you can change the temperature. Um, you know, if you want to insulate it from your surroundings. So they have a lot of good labs. Like I said, they're usually more advanced for the more advanced chemistry class. Let's say I want to get rid of this. I can click remove it.
um, your students can actually workbench. They can add a new workbench and still keep the old workbench. So it's a pretty neat website to actually have them do what they would do in a lab. And I like some of the design labs. I usually show them a video of how to do this first, and, and then I let them come here and do it with the numbers they want to use. Thanks, Donna. That was a uh, wow. That's really uh, a great tool sure. for for your chemistry classes. So uh, I'm going to go back in and uh, share my screen now. OK, so we're that one and. Uh, OK, so, Jared, I'll let you take over here. Um, I'm going to. This is uh, on the uh, CK12 uh, PLIC series, and I know that you use this for your math classes quite a bit. So I'm going to stop my sharing and let you share, and uh, you can uh, give some insight to the audience on how you use these tools. Yeah, thank you, Esperanza. Um, so let me see if I get my screen shared here. Okay. Can you see the uh, CK12 Plix series screen up? Yes, I can. Yeah, perfect. So um, CK12 is a website that um, me and a colleague in our math department discovered a few years ago. And um, you do have to have a login uh, for this website, uh, but it's real simple to get a login uh, and a password. And the PLIX, P-L-I-X, is Play, Learn, Interact, and Explore. And the idea here is, uh, since me being math, uh, there's different branches that you can choose from. And all of the choices that I chose when I log into my uh, CK12 login are up above the top here. And um, what you can do is kind of have a uh, choice on which branch you want to be in. And there are these uh, interactives uh, for each of these different um, uh, subjects that I would cover. And what I'll do in my classes is uh, use these to break up the monotony of lecturing, or maybe I'll put them in my online classes for them to uh, interact with uh, rather than reading through the textbook to learn something. So um, for example, uh, I'm in the statistics branch here. So, um, you can, I just chose this normal distribution one. And what these plicks will do is, um, when it loads here, they'll give you a little um, uh, problem that you can solve. And when you go to um, play with the plicks, on the screen here, you can challenge yourself and maybe change up the, the interactivity on the screen here. So you can see this normal curve and I can expand out how much is shaded under the curve and how it's showing me that the further and further I get away under the shaded under the curve, the more percentage I have that is being shaded under under this curve. And so I can answer the question here that says what proportion would likely fall within two standard deviations. And if I set it on two standard deviations, my rule would tell me uh, about 95% would, it's not letting me, uh, okay, so. I can type that in there. And so uh, it's pretty interesting to just have the students be able to see what is being asked of them uh, with this interaction. Um, probability 
is another place that I find um, a lot of times we don't have time to, uh, or I don't have the supplies to have a bunch of six-sided dice to roll or um, try to get back to the probability questions, um, or we don't have a bunch of decks of cards to pull cards out of a deck. So you can deal with some of the probability uh, interactions that they have. Um, then uh, uh, the besides statistics and probability, so actually here's one of my favorite probability ones to do. It's drawing different colored balls out of a bag because um, it's something that I think a lot of books will put in the problems and sometimes it gives more of a visual as to what the student is actually doing with how many balls you're pulling out of the bag and what that probability would be. And every time you pull um, a marble out, uh, it changes the probability of what is left in side of the bag yeah. okay and so that is that's with probability and statistics um in addition to probability and statistics um calculus is one that i'll often use and uh, and uh, in the trigonometry section as well so there are a lot of fun um interactions and again it, it gives students the visual that a lot of times, you know, we can't, uh, maybe we can't go outside and be so many kilometers from the building. And so we can kind of see the problem at hand and change it up rather than, um, you know, doing a different problem over and over again, changing the numbers. We can see it done uh, in that uh, interaction there. So, mm-hmm. So I will. Okay, so uh, then, thank you, Jared. That that's uh, those are some really great resources uh, to utilize in, in math. And I, I had a question out there, uh, in the chat asking about uh dif different math resources. So, uh, just in this one uh, Plix uh, one uh, website, CK12, you have access to Plix series uh, uh, for for a lot of different branches of mathematics. So, um, again, you can link to this right in our presentation. So thanks, Jared. Uh, I, if you uh, stop sharing, then I'll pick up from there. Yep. All right. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Share here. Okay. And so I'll go to the next one and uh, current slide. Uh, it always goes back one for whatever reason. So th 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 I just uh, highlighted a you know several different. Uh, math uh, area, so I'll keep going there. Uh, so this is a resource uh, in physics that uh, I utilize, um, and I'm not going to go into it for um, you know for so that I can allow uh, the audience to engage with us beyond the presentation. But um, this is the physics aviary, and uh, I utilize this these resources. You can see here, for example. Um, dealing with uh, electricity and magnetism. I use this one on uh, accelerating electrons. Um, um, you can see that there are some mechanics resources, that, the Atwood's machine that you would, might use in a, a, a general studies physics one class where you're dealing with, uh, you know, Newtonian mechanics at, uh, at a, you know, at a algebra and trig level, for example. Um, and so this is a great tool. They're all open. The nice thing is if you see this button here that says see resources, those are learning activities that you can you can do with that particular simulator. So if you click on that, um, they're actually activities built and you can take those activities and use them as is or you can customize them um, as you will find with a great many, um, uh, you know, simulator resources, you can um, you know, adjust the activities to your liking. Uh, this is another example of a resource that I use in physics. Um, this is a, 
this is an interactive tutorial on waves. So, uh, you know, waves uh, you cover in the general physics one, you typically focus in on the basics of waves, sound waves. And then when you get into general physics two, which is electricity and magnetism, you come back to this information on waves because you're uh, looking at things like refraction, reflection, you know, diffraction, interference. And so I utilize this tutorial uh, primarily in my um, physics two course, but uh, there are some great resources that you can also utilize this for in uh, general physics one. Um, so, and then this, these are just some applets that I've come across on the web. I, I, I use the one on Rutherford scattering in my uh, general physics two class um, where I have them, you know, we're investigating uh, here. We're looking at, you know, uh, how they established what the atom actually looks like and that kind of thing. So, you know, you're moving into the more modern physics type, type topics. And so um, uh, I like this site because I can, uh, there's a variety of applets. I'm not showing them all in this screenshot, but there are lots, lots more. And, uh, you know, during the discussion, if, if you'd like, we can go out and take a look at them. I'm trying to leave as much time as possible because I really want to do get your, I really want to get you involved as well. Okay. And so um, <clears throat> these are, this is just a listing of some other uh avenues for finding open content. Uh, you can see uh, in, a, in a lot of these uh, uh, websites are, have, have free open textbooks, like the Open Textbook Library. Um, I, and then um, Merlot, you can access textbooks, you can access learning activities, simulators. Merlot is a, re a referatory for a great many um, open resources, not just in STEM, but in you know, a wide variety of topics. Um, this um, BC campus has a great um, collection of textbooks. OpenStax, of course, you know, they're the, they're like, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, they got in this game way before a lot of these other resources that I'm sharing, you know, that they, they're well known for uh, their open textbooks. Um, and so, the, if, if you have access to this presentation, which, you know, if you didn't grab it from the conference platform, I'm more than willing to share um, my email addresses at the end and you reach out to me and I'll send it to you. And all of these links are clickable, but I, I'm not going to click on them now. Uh, but, uh, you know, during this discussion, if you if you want to take a look at, at some some of these resources, we can definitely do that. Uh, and so. Um, now we get to the part of the um, of the workshop where we want to hear, you know, what resources you're using. So um, I, I'm going to stop the share at this moment and just open it up for some discussion. Uh, you can we can do that through the chat. I don't know if you have microphone capability. I, I think the presenters are the ones that have that capability, but we'll be more than happy to respond if you post a question in the chat. Um, so tell us about some simulators that you that you know about that we didn't share. Uh, if there are some activities that you do with those simulators, we'd be more than happy to hear about that. And if you know of some resources that we haven't uh, presented uh, in, in terms of textbooks and that type of thing, please feel free to share. So I'm going to stop here and um, feel free to post a question in the chat. Uh, if you have microphone capability, um, unmute yourself and ask a question. Oh, don't tell me we did a perfect job here. I'm sure you have a question <laughs> or two for us, or you have a resource that we don't we don't know about. Um, please. Uh, we want you engaged as well. I see we have quite a few participants. Uh, so I'm hoping that we get a question or two out of that.
Okay. Okay. Well, uh, I, I want to yes. uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I thought maybe you, are you asking a question? Okay. So um, thank you so much, um, Professor. Uh, I just okay, I did so want I... to uh, I did want to share our contact information. That way, if somebody wants to okay. ask a question off camera, so to speak, uh, they can have access to us and feel free uh, to do that. I do see a question in the chat. It says, uh, "How much do you spend for your science lab?" Okay. Uh, yeah, we these are all free resources, so I'm not spending anything, uh, and neither are the students. Uh, do all of these resources okay. require internet access? Um, th yes, most of them are web-based. Uh, there may be a few that you could do offline uh, by downloading the, the um, th there's a capability of downloading it, especially if it's like an applet, you may be able to download it and run it outside of the web. Um, but most are internet-based. So the questions are coming in now. <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, um, Professor, I I want to read the next question for you um, because yeah. um, the participant can hear. Uh, you know. So um, from uh, M South. Yeah, M South. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Um, from Cambodia. Yes. Okay. The first question is, uh, how do how much do you spend for your science lab? Yeah, that's what I that's I, I think I was answering this question because you. I was I was saying that um all of the resources that we're sharing are free. And uh, yes. So the goal here is to have open content that students can use freely and that faculty members have the capability in many instances to modify and uh, you, you know repurpose it according to what they need in their class right so this allows the yeah. faculty member the flexibility of customizing these free resources to do what they want in their class and the students don't uh, incur any cost to use these resources that's what open means right open education resource means that it has a creative commons license that allows you to utilize it freely. Okay, thank you. Yes. So next one, Professor, how do you develop science STEM in your organization? Uh, that's a very broad question. Um, <laughs> in our organization, <laughs> meaning at our college, well, as you, I, I'll say this, in, in the process of developing STEM resources for our class, we operate with the mindset we want it to be as cost effective as possible for the faculty member for the college and for the student right it, the more we can utilize free resources that are you know primarily web-based like these simulators imagine you don't have to go out and spend money on bunsen burners and beakers and manipulatives because that's all freely available in the simulation itself right so yeah you know you get to the point where you can do your science labs anywhere right so we want to we develop our stem content with that in mind we can do this stuff anywhere because it's done over the web right so we don't need brick and mortar per se right we don't need buildings we don't need labs they're all online Okay. Yes, so can you, I sir. share our contact so information? One. Can I share our contact information? Okay, yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Let me do that. Okay, um, yes, that'll yes, get yes. us. Okay. Okay. So this next slide. Oh, why is it not going forward? It's not. Let me let me do it again. Let me try it again. Okay. Okay, and then there. Okay, so there on this screen, anybody in the audience, here's our contact information. And if you have a question that you want to ask at some, uh, you know, at some point uh, beyond this this meeting room, 
uh, feel free to reach out. I'm always happy to answer questions and I'm sure my two co-presenters would be happy to engage with you if you have questions about resources uh, that we use or, um, or just you know questions in general. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us because uh, you know one of the things we wanted to foster by being here today is this idea of cooperation, right? We want this OER movement that we're part of to, you know, go as far as possible to impact as many student students' lives as possible. And the only way we can do that is by sharing. So being here today is first and foremost an opportunity for sharing and collaboration, right? So, uh, you know, we don't want it to be a one-sided conversation. So we hope to hear from you uh, if you're in our audience and, and have questions or just want to reach out to us. We'd be more than happy to engage you. Okay, thank you, Professor, for uh, sharing the content for the participant to contact you. Okay, so now we have uh, a lot more questions we're asking you. Okay, so yeah, I just want to read the question from Una from Cambodia. Um, so do all of these resources require internet access or can they work offline for rural areas? It, yeah, she means that uh, Yes, download it, right? Oh, no. um, I, I do believe that there are some some of them that have that capability. I, I haven't, in, you know, checked that for all of them. Um, but uh, in some instances, they are available for use offline. Uh, but oh, yes, yeah. Just pay be be, um, you know, careful in doing that, that you um, that you um, are utilizing them in the way that the creator intended, right? Because even though it has a Creative Commons license, you have to follow what that license allows you to do. Okay, thank you. Right. So, uh, yeah, next one. Um, so, you're from Cambodia again. So, has there been any research on how the simulator my third compares to hands-on STEM activities. Thank you. Um, I am sure that there's oodles of research out there on a comparison of utilizing open content versus, um, you know, traditional for pay content um, it, it regarding perfor students' performance. Uh, I can't quote you any of the actual research studies or any stats out of those studies. If one of my co-presenters has any knowledge about that or has done any, uh, you know, investigations or research on that and can answer the question, feel free to chime in. Uh, but unfortunately, I don't get much into that type of research because I'm more interested in taking this content and adapting it so that my students, um, you know, have freely available content to use. Yes, thank you. So next one is uh, from again from Cambodia. Um, are there any unintended results as we emphasize this idea of STEM? Uh, mm, I, I'm not sure what unintended results means per se. Um, I will say one of the unintended results that I've, you know, from my perspective, what it means is that the students are very happy when you tell them day one, they have you, they don't have to purchase anything for your class, right? Or it's gonna be very cheap to take your class as far as materials go. Uh, they're very happy about that. But I, okay. I mean, did, did, um, did I go in with the idea that they're gonna be happy? I don't, I don't know that right off. So I, maybe, maybe that's, you know, one of the unintended things, happy students. I'm sure Donna and Jerry would agree when you tell students that things, your, you know, they don't have to pay for things to take your class, they get really happy. Okay, thank you, sir. So participants, do you have any more questions for asking um, um, professor and co-presenters? I, I see a question from Marina. Are you able to teach students using just simulators, no material at all? I think by material, she, if you mean physical handheld, you know, um, resources, yes. Um, of course, we have, you know, content that we supplement 
beyond the simulators, right? They're going to use the simulators, but they may, I may have a, um, for example, there may be some reading in on some other materials that relate to the simulator. Okay. So go and read this content in this free textbook or go and try this tutorial at this free website and then come back and do this simulation. So it's like you're pulling free resources from a variety of places and grouping them together in a way to create a curriculum that students can utilize to get through your course, right? So um, if right. you're and asking, it, it, do I use anything besides simulators in my labs and lectures? Absolutely. Right. They and don't if I can pay just... for, they don't have to pay for any of that. Whether yeah, it's and a if I can... or they don't pay for anything as far as the material, the the tools that they need for my course. And if I can interject, uh, Esperanza, um, and if you mean like, are we teaching content in our class? A lot of times, students will take, uh, you know, for my my class in particular, they might take the lecture and then they're taking the lab at the same time. So they're learning the content in lecture, and then our lab is paced with our lecture. So they might be learning the content in lecture class, and then they go to lab class and they either do the simulation or if, you know, if it was not an online lab, then they would do it in the lab. So it's the same thing. Um, both of our, all of our labs are timed with our lectures. So they're actually learning the material in one class and then they're doing it in another class. Um, Jared, if you, you know, I know that simulators are definitely not the only tool you would be using in your class. Am I correct in saying that? Yeah, that's, that's right. Um, for me, you know, math is, is the hardest part is for them to kind of see some of the stuff that's going on with the math, like an actual representation of it. Um, so no, I'm not teaching full blown simulators. Um, but I think as my co presenters pointed out, uh, we use them just as a additional tool that they can use uh, that they can have in their course. Mm. Yeah, we okay, have a lot of. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Go thank ahead. you. No, no, I was just going to say I have a lot of, um, you know, uh, simulators that I use in to interject with my lectures because it's kind of the same thing for me in chemistry as it is for Jared's class, right? In math class, you can't always visualize, and it's the same thing in chemistry. So I'll use a simulation in the middle of my lecture to show them, you know, if I want them to look at what the hydrogen atom looks like then I'll use a simulation to do that. And so we kind of use them all together just to enhance our students and their, uh, you know, learning and any kind of way that we can try to reach them to make this better for them. Okay, uh, thank you. So now the question from Bisset, okay. Um, professor, how to encourage uh, students to study STEM? Ooh, that's a, that's a monumental task. Uh, um, to encourage. So that 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 does get into the heart of oh, your conference, comment. right? This idea of mentoring, right? So, you know, one of the things that I feel like can really benefit students, you know, and this goes beyond using open or free materials, and that is oh, to, no, no, no. you know, to to have um to be able to see other people that that you know, look like that student are doing STEM, right? So I'm an African-American female. Uh, one, of, one of the ways I can encourage other African-American females to do STEM is by mentoring them, right? Interacting with them, letting them know that I'm doing it and these are the challenges that I faced and you can do it and we can, you know, so it, if you see somebody else doing what you want to do and that person is from a similar demographic as you, then that's an encouragement, right? Um, but, you know, it does take for uh, those who have been successful to reach back and help those who are trying to be successful, right? So mentoring is a very important part of encouraging students to do STEM. 
And I think, uh, you know, your conference is, you know, is, is very important because mentoring is much needed in this area. And that, that, that doesn't have anything to do necessarily with our presentation, but that's a great question that was asked. Mentoring is a key part of that. Yeah, 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 thank you. Okay, Jared and Donna, you have anything to add? No, okay, thank so, you for the opportunity. Uh, okay, okay, thank you. So next one is the how to, in, uh, okay, from MSOM from Cambodia, so how to integrate STEM quality in rural areas students. Yeah, because actually STEM has been applied in Cambodia, but it's not entire because um, rural areas like we, yeah, so how can we integrate them to rural areas students? Okay, thank you. Oh, uh, you know, we, we face those similar kind of challenges in this country. I will say this, um, th that, um, you know, <laughs> our colleges is, is, uh, is not as our community college is a small community college, fairly small, but we're growing, but we do have, um, you know, our interaction with students who come from fairly rural backgrounds, right? Uh, some of those students might be first generation, meaning they're the first in their family to go to college, right? And so um, <clears throat> how we can get these students exposed to STEM is through projects, community-based projects where they're at, right? So that means if we want them to do STEM, we got to go to them, right? We got to bring those resources and opportunities to them. For example, I live in a fairly small town. Um, on the west side of the Mississippi River. I'm small compared to the town where the community college that I teach at is located. And what I've done is partner with the local museum to, uh, to uh, engage students that are in this small town with STEM activities. So you bring it to them, right? They can't come to you, so you gotta come, you gotta go to them. Yes. Okay. Thank you, um, Professor. So, um, yeah, I have a question. So, as a mentor, so as a mentor, so how can we motivate mentees to, um, you know, to use STEM effectively in classroom? So, how do you? How you're asking from? You're from asking us how do we motivate our students, or? I motivate mentees yeah because i am a, a mentor a mentor ah. so how can i motivate the, yeah i just want to strategies for motivating um, mentees to um, use them effectively in classroom well i you know um okay. well put it this way you 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 have you have to do it you have to engage them in a way that embodies the kind of creativity that we're trying to share here right we're trying to share information on uh, a different way to engage and do STEM, right? Uh, but one thing for sure, no matter what tool you use, whether it's a free resource or a for pay resource or some other resource, you have got to meet the student where they're at. You have got to make this stuff relevant and personal to them, right? You've got to engage them on a more personal level, if it, if it has meaning to them, why is this important to me? You have to answer that question for the student. And if you can do that as a mentor, you can find a common ground to work with them, right? Yeah, because- Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's important that you have some type of rapport or, or you know, you know them, you get to know the people you're working with. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. So next question um, from uh, from Bing Long Gong, okay, I think. So how to evaluate students by using app for teaching students? Do you have any tip to share? I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Jared or Donna, if you, if you have anything you want to add there, I'm, yeah, I'm not. Yeah, I think, I think, 
how do how can we evaluate the students by using the simulations um i i don't tie the simulations to my grade per se um i think as esperanza and donna and i have have shared we uh we use the simulations in more of a um additional fact so um you know can can i get a student to see what's happening with the math as opposed to just solving equations over and over again. Um, Donna mentioned with the with the atoms in chemistry, can you get them to physically see something in front of you on a simulation as opposed to just, you know, telling them that it's there. So, um, and I don't know, maybe, maybe now that I, I think the way I understand the question to be is, do we evaluate their learning through the simulations? Uh, Donna's, Donna said she, she do. does the grading with the, some of the chemistry labs, um, but I don't do any grading with the simulations. Uh, I just give them another thing to use as far as, as learning. But I think with the labs, Donna, you probably, or, or maybe Esperanza with your labs that y'all use, y'all probably use it more as a grade than, than I ever do. So. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah, in, in, I, my, I, in my course is it these are the actual experiments. I'm using mm -hmm. the simulator as a way to get them to do experiments. Donna? Right. And I, I grade mine like on especially on those ones. Yeah, if sorry, if those ones that are uh, auto graded, like on the you know, the Kim Collective, if I'm using an auto an auto graded one where they have to type in the answer, then they have to show me that they got it correct. And so if they don't show me that they got it correct, then, you know, I know their math was wrong. And I'll also make them show me the math that they did to get that answer. And the last and final thing I make them show me when I'm grading them is their workbench. So I make them either take a picture of their workbench and they can use their phone, they can use a screenshot. But, um, you know, we have one lab and they have to put an indicator in it and it's going to change color. Well, they have to show me that they did that part of the lab. So I make them show me a picture of their workbench. I make them show me a picture of the work that they do to get the answer. And then I make them show me the picture of the answer so showing it was correct. So, yeah, I use mine. Um, you know, I'm all about trying to hold them responsible. And so I don't just let them um, type in an answer because they may get that from another student. So I, I kind of hold them accountable all along the way by making them show me those three different steps. The workbench, they have to show me their work and then the correct answer. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, so yeah. I'm so sorry for Miss um, I'm sold because we have no more time for no the, you answering the question. So you can contact um, other presenters directly as a, you know, uh, as parents I'll show you the, con the contents of the, you know, f contact. So you can contact them directly I'm so sorry